The scripture is, So likewise ye when ye shall see all these things, know that it's near, even at the doors. Technology. Amen? Amen. Isn't it wonderful? I knew we were going to have this dilemma, and I thought, well, it is what it is. After we go through this one week, then we'll be ready from here on. Not this week, but from there on. <laughs> anyway. Let's have another word of prayer, shall we? Father God, we thank you again for the privilege of worship, and we pray your spirit will not only be here today, but Lord, be in our hearts, our minds. And Lord, may you be paramount in our characters. May it be your character. We pray we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> still technology, as you can see. Title of the message this morning, Communion for the Times. There is undeniably very much that is tremendously unusual about the times in which we are living. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. It's beyond question for the thinking person that we are at the verge of the end of this world's history. The earth as it is, is ready to explode at any time. The condition of the Christian church in America, the rise of all of the issues that are happening today are 
not only surprising, cataclysmic, shocking, but uh, they are beyond explanation. They defy explanation, as a matter of fact, because of the things that we see taking place around us. We wonder how much longer it can continue to last. Collision course for planet Earth, isn't that right? And if I have to keep doing this, I can do this too. <laughs> so anyway, this one, migrant shelters cost New York City taxpayers $20 million per month. How long is that going to last? How sustainable is that? How long will it continue to happen? I've got to have it plugged in right here. I've reset it. I've done everything I can. It's just not going to work. Yeah. yeah. So here it is. Kids are ousted from school to make room for migrants. Isn't that amazing? And it's happening not just in one city across America, but uh, all over the place. Unacceptable. Biden and Democrats are under fire after migrants placed in school, forcing kids to learn remotely. New York City Democrats are furious as migrant crisis forced the daughter out of high school. Isn't that interesting? Here we go. A secret phone surveillance program is spying on millions of Americans. I've been preaching this for the last 18 months. And people are saying, no, now it's on the news. They finally has come forward to admitting that it's been here for a long, long time. Anti-Semitism at elite colleges masks a deeper root of, of DEI dominance, diversion, equity, inclusion, if you know anything about that, in higher education. It's amazing. Anti-Israel rioters storm the airport, flood the runway, looking for Jewish students. <coughs> in that interesting? Now look at this one. Here you go. That will be real one day soon. It will happen. That's been edited to wake you up. But that will be real one day soon. Isn't that right? Amen. It will take place. And uh, when that does happen, we hope and pray by God's grace that we realize the signs of the times. Is there a changer? I change so it won't work on that. Look at this one here. China has hacked dozens of U.S. utilities. It continues on. You say, well, where are we going with this? Well, hang on. We're getting there. Terror attacks are coming when we least expect it as migrant encounters shatter records, experts warn. Coming like a freight train to your neighborhood, they say. Axis of evil. Biden administration ignites fear over alarming invitation to nuclear enemies at vital atomic testing sites. Isn't that amazing? As it continues on, look at this one. Oregon opioid deaths increased 13 times after drug decriminalization law. We have to do something different. Isn't that amazing? And it goes on and on. On and on we go with these issues. How American universities became hotbeds for terrorist sympathizers. That has been going on for quite some time, about 30 years, as a matter of fact, give or take. Uh, fentanyl is the number one cause of death for Americans age 18 to 45. Isn't that interesting? As it continues on, Congress is feeling the heat from groups demanding the ban on contracts with Chinese film taking firm taking Americans' DNA. Isn't that amazing? So here's what we're trying to say. America is in serious trouble. Can you say amen? Okay. Now, we could go on and on. I could go on for the next hour showing you some of the headlines, but that's not the point. That's not the point at all. <coughs> what we're saying is it's a lot later than what we're saying. It is. It really is because the Bible says he'll cut the time short in righteousness for the elect sake of a short work will I make upon the earth. Amen? And uh, we know that the servant of the Lord says the final events will be rapid one. So be right before us. Absolutely. There it is. And then the scripture reading, Matthew 24, verse 33, if you have your Bibles this morning. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 33, this is where we are today. You know? One would have to be a fool and a blind person not to see that the words of this prophecy are nigh at hand because we see lawlessness everywhere we look almost. Is that right? 
on every hand. Matthew 24, verse 33, the Lord says, So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, we don't have time to go into all the issues, but it's all there in Matthew 24, Luke 13, and uh, uh, Mark, uh, Mark the, uh, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. And so there it is, the signs of the times. So in the first century, going back now, to get the context here, the greatest event, not just in human history, but all of history, was even at the doors. Isn't that right? When you think about history, that's right. And the disciples of Christ, who were to be the great evangelists of the world, who were supposed to be there trumpeting into the world that Christ said in three days he would rise from the tomb, were not faring so well. The Messiah's ultimate proof that he was a divine son of God who came from heaven was to be proven beyond the shadow of a doubt by the resurrection. And the disciples' job was to tell the world, as is our job. At his death, they should have been proclaiming, he said this would happen. Here are the prophecies. He also said he would rise again. In fact, there's a song about it, isn't there? A very popular song. Still today, they sing it. They should have gathered the entire nation at the tomb. Think of that, if they would have. The impact it would have had on humanity. How different the course of humanity might have been, how much more would have been written outside of the Bible. Oh, yes. But instead, right before this monumental event, we find them doing something else. <coughs> we pick up the story of the desire of ages. And I'm just quoting here in the Desire of Age that it is uh, reading a very interesting uh, quote here from page 644. On this last evening with his disciples, Jesus has had much to tell them. If they had been prepared to receive what he longed to impart, they would have been saved from heartbreaking anguish, from disappointment and unbelief. But Jesus saw that they could not bear what he had to say. As he looked into their faces, the words of warning and comfort were stayed upon his lips. Moment passed in silence. Jesus appeared to be waiting. The disciples were ill at ease. The sympathy and tenderness awakened by Christ's grief seemed to have passed away in his sorrowful words, pointing to his own suffering, and made little impression. The glances they cast upon each other told of jealousy and contention. There was strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? This contention carried on in the presence of Christ grieved and wounded him. Can you grasp the gravity of this event? With the great opportunity to convert the world, with all that is about to happen, they are filled with strife. Self-seeking. Christ must have been walking around, certainly with his mouth open and gas, thinking, seriously? What is really shocking is he had something to say, something more that could have been written. Some great words, but he stopped short and didn't speak them. We will look at today that the prophetic implications, with the opportunities that abound, what would Jesus say if he walked amongst us this morning? What words of wisdom, direction, blessing would he be ready to pour out upon us? And more importantly, upon the world. But might they be stayed upon his lips because of what he sees? I, like many of you, because I've talked to a lot of you about these issues, see that people are scared, uncertain, terrified, doubting. Others wonder, as we spoke about in Sabbath school, where is God? Others feel almost to where the are questioning their Christianity, their sincerity. 
and still others are indifferent. Our minds are caught up on something other than what the prophetic times in which we live demand our minds to be. Isn't that right? Oftentimes they are. So what does Jesus do to refocus his disciples? I would say young disciples, as was correctly pointed out in Sabbath school this morning. So he takes them back to square one to remind them what it's all about. I continue the quote from D.A., page 644. How was Christ to bring these poor souls where Satan would not gain over them a decided victory? How could he show that a mere profession of discipleship did not make them disciples or ensure them of a place in his kingdom? How could he show them that it is a loving service, true humility, which constitutes real greatness? Greatness is not weighed in how many serve you, but how many you serve. How was he to kindle love in their hearts and enable them to comprehend what he longed to tell them, like we pointed out again in Sabbath school this morning? Turn with me to John chapter 13. We find an interesting scenario that developed here in the book of John. We're reading in chapter what? 13. 13, that's right. Here in John chapter 13, we look at verses 3 through 5. Here we are. This is the uh, upper room experience when Christ is uh, meeting with his disciples at, uh, before the feast of Passover. And we read here in verses 3 through 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and he was come from God and went to God, he rose from supper, laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to what? Wash. To wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherein he was good. So it's interesting what he does. He knows that nobody's going to eat until someone comes in and washes their feet. That is the culture, the practice, the custom in that day. He knows nobody is coming to do it. And then in a little bit, all of them are going to start feeling the pressure. Just like one of those dreaded, quote, we need somebody other than Frida or Carol to take these names of individuals in the community who are wanting in-home Bible study Saturday afternoon. Say, whoa, stop meddling and get back to preaching, Pastor Steve. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> preaching. The disciples at that time made no move toward serving one another. Jesus waited for a time deliberately to see what they would do. And now the past master teacher, what does he do? He goes to work. He dresses for the part, and in their honor, no, to their horror, he begins doing what? Washing your feet. So... When you and I are willing to go out and give Bible studies, we're serving one another. Amen? Amen. And that's right. And I'll just quote it in Matthew 25 and verse 40. The Bible says, And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say to you, Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto many. So this action opened the eyes, I continue to quote from the Zarbe, page 644. It opened the eyes of the disciples. Bitter shame and humiliation filled their hearts. They understood the unspoken rebuke and saw themselves in altogether a new light. So Christ expressed his love for his disciples. Their selfish spirit filled him with sorrow, but he entered into no controversy with them regarding their difficulties. Do you think it's possible that maybe the master has put a towel around his waist and began washing our feet? Do you think that from this event, for whatsoever reason it was, but from it, some things have been exposed about us? And the purpose is to open my eyes, to open your eyes. One of the last acts of Jesus' life on this earth was to put that towel around his waist, kneel down, 
and wash his brother's feet. And so he performed a servant's part. Amen? <clears throat> That's what he did. Now the next statement, even though uh, even the most hard-hearted of them, Judas, listen to this. The constraining power of that love was felt by Judas when the Savior's hands were bathing those soiled feet and wiping Judas's feet with a towel. His heart, Judas's heart, thrilled through and through with the impulse then and there to confess his sin. Wow. And so, this is how we start over. Amen? Amen. It is. This is what Jesus is after. He's after your heart, your confession, mine. Satan meant it for bad, but God means it to make us better. So we're supposed to be feeling some conviction, the Bible says in John 16, verse 8. In fact, that is the Holy Spirit's central job. The Bible says that when He has come, that's the Holy Spirit, He will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit today, right now, in this church, in my heart, in yours. Amen? It is. However, when the conviction comes, and it will come, and I'm sure you know what I mean, we have a choice. <coughs> it's the same decision Peter must make. Remember chapter 13 and verse 8? Peter said to him, when he came to Peter to wash his feet, he says, Lord, Kind of like, what are you doing, Lord? Why are you kneeling down and washing my feet? Don't you know who I am? In fact, he just impulsively, he's called the impetuous Peter because like many of us, he puts his mouth in gear before he puts his brain in gear. He said, Lord, you shall what? Never wash my feet. You know, I'm out of here. You're not, I'm not allowing this to happen. And the Lord says, If I wash thee not, thou shalt have what? No part. Or no part with me. And, uh, you know, there's humor in the Bible. And all of a sudden, Peter shifted gears real fast. He said, oh, Fine, Lord. Then just give me a bath on the spot. Amen. <laughs> he changed his mind real fast. And that's funny. But it's also meaningful. He realized his immediate error in his heart, which came out of his mouth. We read on, the service which Peter refused was a type of a higher cleansing. Christ had come to wash the heart from the stain of sin, and refusing to allow Christ to wash his feet, Peter was refusing the higher cleansing included in the lower. Whoa. He was really rejecting his Lord. It is not humiliating to the Master to allow him to work for our purification. The truest humility is to receive with thankful heart any provision made on our behalf and with earnestness do service for Christ. Amen? So the service, brothers and sisters, that we're about to partake upon in a few minutes here is awesome. It's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Amen? It really is. This is how we move on this is how we start over again. To recognize that this foot washing is a symbol of a higher cleansing. Peter's all in with it. He says, Lord, just wash me totally. Is that my desire? Yes. Is that your desire? Yes. Continuing the quote, Christ is still speaking of a higher cleansing as illustrated by the lower. He who came from a bath was clean, but the sandaled, sandaled feet soon became dusty and again needed to be washed. Are your sandaled feet dusty? Mine are. Ours are. And they need to be washed. So Peter and his brethren had been washed in the great fountain, open for sin and uncleanness. Christ acknowledged them. As he is. Even when we drop the ball at such a late hour, Christ is there. Yes, he is. 
inviting us, yes, to be cleansed. How? Again. Amen? Amen. I mean, I like that, don't you? It's necessary. It's imperative. It's good news. It's a striking part of reality of the gospel. Amen? Amen. In fact, do you know when that person is kneeling before you, he or she stands waiting for your heart to accept that cleansing from Christ. And when we let Christ wash our feet, when we respond to the conviction, when we acknowledge our guilt and wrong, and Christ in the person of a friend washes your feet, the results are wonderful. It's an act of faith, yes it is, but it's reality in heaven. Amen? Amen. It absolutely is, hands down. Like Peter and his brethren, I'm continuing the quote, we too have been washed in the blood of Christ, baptized, put on Christ, had all our sins washed away, our name was written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life in heaven. I read on. Repeat, like Peter and his brethren, we too have been washed in the blood of Christ, yet often through contact with evil, the heart's purity is soiled. We must come to Christ for his cleansing grace. Don't you like that? We need that. We don't use that as an excuse to continue sinning. God forbid. Praise God that provision is there. Amen. Now that they are clean, now that their minds are attending the great reminder and lesson, the what is this all about moment? Quote, in his life and lessons, Christ had given a perfect exemplification of the unselfish ministry which has its origin in God. God does not live for himself by creating the world and by upholding all things. He is constantly ministering for others. He makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust, Matthew 5.45. This ideal of ministry God has committed to his son. Jesus was given to stand at the head of humanity. Praise God for that that by his example, he might teach what it means to minister. His whole life was under a law of service. You ever hear that before? The law, you know, we've heard all, a lot about the law of God. I mean, if Adventists still no doubt about the law of God, something's wrong with you, amen? No, but what about the law of service? Amen? That's where it really is. The law of service tells me that my heart has been melted at the foot of the cross. And the Holy Spirit of God is controlling my life. The law of service is what we are, by God's grace, looking at, longing, and hoping for as God's character becomes part of ours. Do you think that in our individual hearts today, this can be the beginning of that? That through this, we are to be like our master? Maybe we, like the disciples, we're also not ready to live a life of service. And maybe we too needed this event to expose our sin and weakness. And like them, we're being invited to respond to conviction and be washed clean, that we may get about a life that is led also by the law of service. Yes. It is beyond question that America's in trouble. But yet, there's the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, where sinners plunge beneath that blood and lose all their guilt stains. We go to Jesus. Amen? That's what it's about. The Holy Watcher from heaven is present at this season to make it one of soul searching, of conviction of sin. And it's a blessed assurance of sins forgiven. Christ in the fullness of his grace is there to change the current of the thoughts. He's there. Yes. By right? faith. He's there. He shows up. He's here. To change the current of grace of the thoughts that have been ruining us and running in selfish channels. 
The Holy Spirit quickens the sensibility of those who follow the example of their Lord. And as the Savior's humiliation for us is remembered through thought, linked with thought, a chain of memories is called up. Memories of God's great goodness and of the favor and tenderness of earthly friends. Blessings forgotten, mercies abused, kindness slighted are called to mind. Roots of bitterness that have crowded out the precious plan of love are made manifest. Defects of character, neglects of duty, ingratitude to God, coldness toward our brothers and sisters are called to remembrance. Sin is seen in the light in which God views it. Our thoughts are not thoughts of self-complacency, but of service and self-censure and humiliation. The mind is energized to break down every barrier that has caused alienation. Evil thinking and evil speaking are put away, and by God's grace put away forever. Amen? Amen. Sins are confessed, they are forgiven. And what comes along? What is left after we have said, Lord, I want to do this right? A, a burning world? A bleak future that offers very little, if any, hope? No, that's not what's left. Not to the true believing Christian. Right here is what's left. It says, the doing grace of Christ comes into the soul and the love of Christ draws hearts together in their lives of unity. Praise God. Amen? Amen. That's what it's all about. That's, what, that's why we come to church. Of course to meet with Jesus. Of course to receive cleansing from God. But also to experience that blessed unity. Amen? Amen. That is what it's about. This is the only answer to the sin-torn, fiery world that will all too soon come after the true, humble Christian in anger and revenge. And yes, it's already coming after the Christians. And this is the message that Christ has for all of us here today. While there is still a little window of probation granted for us, we don't know how short, but I can tell you one thing for sure. Beyond question, I know that time is extremely short. I know it. It is a time for us to arise, lay aside our garments of pride, anger, hatred, selfishness, harsh and unkind words behind closed doors. Hesitate, hesitating to work as a servant for others in our community. And take a towel of humility gird ourselves with the Word of God, and begin serving others by washing your feet. Yeah. That's what it's about. Foot washing is a wonderful experience as we experience not only the cleansing that Christ is inviting us to partake of today, but as it were, after the foot washing is done, after we have surrendered our hearts again to Christ, we say, Lord, I'm undone. I'm unclean, but I want your cleansing grace. Amen? Amen? I still desire that power in my life. I have not forsaken you, my belief in you, my trust in you, my faith in you. I've just messed up. I want all that washed away. I want my slate clean again. I want to hit the reset button and start over again. And I want the computer to come up with a brand new computer that functions 10,000% correct. Amen? Amen? and then enter into it, the very first words, eternal life, please. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's what it's about. Foot washing, service to others. Now, if you think that foot washing, gentlemen, is this, I'm sorry, you got it wrong. Uh-uh. It's supposed to be the what? The reverse, am I right? Yeah, too many men are, hey, lady, you do this, don't do that. Understand English? Uh-uh. Right here is the way it should be. Isn't that right? Amen. Yeah. Not just at church once a week on Sabbath morning in front of everybody that you know, but all through the week. Every week of our lives. 
until Jesus comes. That's what it's about. Yeah. Foot washing. And then we can come up afterwards when we're done. By faith, the clean heart. As we once again allow Christ to finish the job in our lives. What's that? The only way we can make it between now and the next communion service is by the grace of God. Amen? We have got to invite Christ once again to apply the provisions of the cross to our heart or we will fail miserably. Am I right? Amen. It has to be. And no, had Venice aren't perfect, they're forgiven. And they stay forgiven by God's grace. Amen?